When I was growing up, Dad built a really nice gate that complemented the fence that uh, separated our property from the neighbor's property and our front from our backyard. It was, it was great, it was tall, it afforded us lots of privacy. And I loved to spend time back there. We had a basketball net, a hockey net, lots of sports equipment. And so, as kids do, and adults as well, I was really focused. I was trying to shoot hoops, not successfully. So I missed, the ball went rolling, and I went after it. The ball hit the gate, and then I hit the gate. But it felt like the gate hit me. I started blaming the gate. It was the gate's fault. It was an evil gate, it was the gate of hell. Now, am I the only one who's, who's done something like this? Who's, who's blamed some kind of object that's not even alive for my pain? Maybe I am. I'll speak for myself. But, you know, there's been other times, you know, you stub your toe against the wall and it's the wall's fault. You twist your ankle on the curb, it's the curb's fault. You get into this kind of blame game. But if you haven't had any experience with that, with just kind of some object, maybe you've gotten into that with other people. You see, this is kind of one of the oldest tricks in the book. If we do this in our normal day-to-day -day life, it's probably a good chance that we do this in the church as well. So I want to bring us back to the Garden of Eden. So what happened there? We all know the story. Adam eats the fruit. God questions Adam and says, why did you do that? What does he do? Turns to his beloved wife. She made me do it, according to Eve. So God questions Eve, why did you do that? And Eve says, the serpent made me do it. And I think there's enough blame to go around. What did Adam and Eve forget? They forgot to trust God. They could have talked to him, asked his advice, done anything, and he would have intervened. But they forgot who God was. We need to know who God is. It's so important. It's central to our gospel today. Who do they say the Son of Man is? You are the Son of the living God. And so what did Adam and Eve end up doing? The serpent had no power. They ended up empowering the serpent. And that is really important as we investigate this gospel today. And we talk about the gates of hell. So in this gospel, we have Jesus confirming Peter as the first pope, giving him and the church actual authority, actual power. And he says to Peter, the gates of hell will not prevail, will not prevail against the church. And you see, sometimes, sometimes we interpret this in a defensive way. You know, we've got to kind of get our shield out and protect ourselves against all that's kind of going on. But this is not what's intended. The church is meant to be on the offensive, pushing back the kingdom of darkness. That power. Think about the exalted, the beautiful, beautiful um, chant that we have in the, in the Easter vigil. Jesus broke the prison bars of death. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? Nowhere. It's done. And so, the kingdom of darkness is meant to be pushed back. The gates of hell are meant to be destroyed, mangled. There's something interesting about gates. They don't move. Gates can swing open and close. You can go through them. Something can come through it at us. But gates are rooted in place. And so the death and resurrection of Jesus and our work in the church, we share in that, in the victory of Christ, is meant to overrun those gates. They're done. Finished. Unless we empower them. And that's a problem. And so how do we, how do we make sure that we're staying within the, the power of God? Holy Spirit, help us. Number one, and we're trying to avoid sin. It's at those times when we turn away from God that we're empowering the kingdom of darkness. It's at those times that we're giving power where power is not supposed to be given. We are free, brothers and sisters, from the power of darkness if we stay within the power of the Holy Spirit. 
We continue to give our lives to Jesus. The kingdom of darkness has no power, has no power over our lives, has no power here. And that is so important to remember. And so instead of blaming those gates for hitting us, we need to use the power of the Holy Spirit, avail ourselves of all the riches and treasures of our faith, and hit out against the power of darkness. So what does that look like? First and foremost, we need to know who Jesus is, and we need to know who we are. Come back to that beautiful scripture today. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We need to know that. We need to live out of that reality. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord of our lives. He's Lord of the church. He's active and on the move today. And we have been purchased at such a great price. We are beloved sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. That is who we are. That is our deepest identity. You know, we often hear in the newspaper headlines all kinds of things about the church. And they're not good. And they can get to our heart. You hear tired and tired, tiring kind of recycled one-liners even at the grocery store. And it's tough to bring up faith in conversation. Because we're weighed down. You know, the gates of hell may not, they may not move, but they seem to have a printing press and a megaphone sometimes. And we can forget who we are. Because we can let the things that we hear sink into our hearts. That we're a defeated people. That we're going on the way to being a footnote in history. You heard that? I have. I've read that all over the place. I think our death is premature. It's prematurely announced. But if you hear enough of that and it gets into your heart, it can start to affect your behavior. We're not lapsed Catholics. We're practicing our faith. But we can become collapsed Catholics. Because we're just tired of being the brunt of the world's jokes and the apparent source of all its problems. We're not. I think we do have to acknowledge the times that we have sinned and ask for forgiveness and repent. We're painfully aware of our shortcomings as a church over the last little while. The last 30 years, 50 years, 70 years, whatever it is, the reality is that this has been with us since the inception of the church because we're fallen human beings. And it doesn't change the words of Jesus today. It doesn't change the fact that the church is founded on rock and that its mission is unstoppable. COVID can't change that. Headlines can't change that. Even sinners within the church can't change that. This will last forever. Forever and ever. So we need to let God write our story. We are an Easter people. We are a people of the resurrection. We are people who have a foretaste of victory. We are a people, brothers and sisters, who need to hold our heads high. Not because we're high and mighty. Because we look up to the cross. The sign and instrument of our salvation. We're a people who know Christ's victory. We're a people who know who Jesus is. We're a people who know who we are. Beloved sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. Sons and daughters of the church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Yes, we know that the church is both human and divine. It's human. It's made up of human beings. You and me. We're not perfect. And we sin and we ask for forgiveness when we do. But the church is also divine. Founded by Jesus himself. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. And displaying great fidelity and great holiness. Many times over throughout the centuries and even now. But that's not making the headlines, is it? Local church sees people come to know Jesus for the first time and seeing people growing deeper in their faith. Local church helps the poor in unprecedented times. Local church embraces new technologies to connect people, to pray together, and to reach people with the message of the gospel. Local church sees a greater return than most as it reopens during pandemic. That local church is us. The people are you. And I'm proud of you. You're not going to see this in the headlines. Well, we actually did see one of them. 
But uh, that's not what it's about. It's about who we are and our fidelity to Jesus. We do these things because we're followers of Christ. We do these things because we're the church and we know who we are. We do these things because we know Christ's victory in our lives. I want to extend it to the world in our place and in our time. And as we do that, as we commit and recommit ourselves to Christ's victory, we will see the kingdom of darkness push back and the gates of hell laying mangled on the ground.